All right, good evening, everybody. I'm Tom Shulock. I'm your friendly operator elevator, friendly <laughs> elevator operator, uh, also a software developer. And tonight, I'm going to talk about Kevin Bacon and index free adjacency. At work this morning, one of my younger colleagues asked, What are you presenting tonight? And I said, Kevin Bacon and index free adjacency. <laughs> he paused for a second and said, Who's Kevin Bacon? <laughs> so, let's start there. <laughs> this is Kevin Bacon. <laughs> He's not a computer scientist. <laughs> this is also Kevin Bacon. He's been around a long time. So long, in fact, He's been in 93 different movies. And it's not just the quantity of movies that he's been in. He's been in a broad array of movies, from rom-coms to coming of age um, to, to big blockbuster movies. You name it, he's been in it. So much so, some college students came up with a game called The Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon and this concept of Bacon's Law where you can choose any random actor and connect them to Kevin Bacon in less than six or fewer hops. Is that your stuff or my stuff? Maybe your stuff. Uh, Just click on your screen. Got this oh, Just hide that. Yeah, if you don't show your entire uh, desktop, you can get that. Yeah, oh, really? If you share your whole desktop, it doesn't? It doesn't. Okay. I do share my old desktop. Yeah. Okay, you're good. All right. So anyway, six degrees of Kevin Bacon, or six DOKB, um, <laughs> sort of follows that same concept of six degrees of separation. That if you pick any two random people, you can connect them through their acquaintances in six or fewer steps. If you've ever been on LinkedIn, um, you can see this writ large where they can show you all the people who are one hop away, two hop away, three hops away. Very useful for finding jobs. So the way this works is movie buffs challenge each other. We'll, we'll name an actor and say, okay, try to connect this actor to Kevin Bacon. And the goal is to find the shortest path back to Kevin Bacon. Now what? <laughs> All right, so before we go any further, we need to talk a little bit about graphs. And so, not these kinds of graphs, these kinds of graphs. So graphs that have vertices and edges. Vertices are the little circles, you can think of them as nodes. The edges are the things that connect the nodes. So, let's try a few of these, just to get a, a feel for how it works. So, you can say Taylor Swift. So, Taylor Swift was in Valentine's Day with Julia Roberts, who was in Flatliners with Kevin Bacon. Say, well, that's, that's not a big deal. Taylor Swift's contemporary musician. No wonder she'd be in a movie or not that far from Kevin Bacon. So we knew Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin was in A Countess from Hong Kong with Tippi Hedren, who was in Jane Man Mansfield's car with, of course, Kevin Bacon. One more, Pee Wee Herman. So Pee Wee Herman was in Pee Wee's Big Adventure with Alice Nunn, who was in The Fury with Charles Durning, who was in Starting Over with Kevin Bacon. So what we're doing here is really graph traversal. So we've got a little diagram of a graph. Traversal is going from one vertex to another, from one node to another, following the edges, following the connections between those nodes or those vertexes. The concept of adjacency, if two vertices, or two vertex, two vertices are one hop away, we consider them to be adjacent. And so this is the first word to, to think about adjacency when things are close to each other. So how would we implement something like six degrees of Kevin Bacon? If only we had something that was really good for storing relationships. Any ideas? So generally you would think if you're talking about relationships, you'd be thinking about a relational database. I mean, it's right there on the label. It says it's, it's a relational database. Um, turns out this doesn't necessarily work for a problem like this. But let's explore a database join, creating adjacencies in the database. So a very simple example, we have an A table, a B table. 
we're joining on the B column. And so we're going to match up this B column with this B column to create this derived table here. All things being equal, if you just tried to do this, you would have to look at this first row, compare it to this row, this row, this row, looking for a match. Then go to the next one, compare it to this row, this row, this row, to get a match. This is called table scan. And it's wildly inefficient. As you might imagine, it'll be m times n, uh, at worst case, to find all your matches to create this join table. But joining is how we create that relational adjacency. But as you can see, it can be kind of slow. So we create indexes. Your database, if you work with databases, probably has indexes on the keys. And so basically an index is really what you'd think an index is. If you have a book and there's something you're trying to find in this book, you could start at page one, page two, page three. You could scan through the whole book to try to find it, or you flip to the back of the book, look at the index, it's on page 42, go to page 42, you're done. Much, much faster, much more efficient. And it saves you the trouble of having to go through the whole book or having to scan the entire table to find what you're looking for. As always, there's no free lunch. Indexes take up more space. You have to maintain them while you're doing adds and deletes. And so that's going to add processing time as well. So you can't just put indexes on virtually all the columns in your tables. So that's what we would call indexed adjacency. We're leveraging these indexes to bring these tables together, to find those relational adjacencies. But it's not going to work here, and I'll tell you why. But before we get to that, we should look at index-free adjacency. And what does that actually mean? So index-free adjacency is where a node points directly to its related node. So we go back to our diagram here. This was originally intended as just a logical diagram, a way to represent the problem. But we can also think of it now as a physical diagram because node 6 will directly point to node 5 and node 7. As you might think, this is much more efficient than trying to bring together these tables. I've got an obligatory SQL statement down here that shows successive joins. So one hop's not so bad. Let's start to do two hops, three hops, four hops, five hops. You can see how your join table gets rather large. Now, th these are the fighting words here where without index-free adjacency, a large graph data set will be crushed under its own weight because the queries will take longer and longer as the data set grows. That's a pretty, that's a pretty incendiary statement. And it comes, of course, from Neo4j. Neo4j is a graph database vendor. And so, well, maybe you could expect them to say something like that. So we'll explore that claim in a little more detail in just a second. But again, just to sort of reinforce the concept, with indexed adjacency, imagine you have a friend that you want to go visit, but you don't know where they live. Using indexed adjacency, it's kind of like walking downtown to the central index, looking up their address, and then going to their house. And in general, this is the relational database approach. For index-free adjacency, you know exactly where they live. You've got a direct pointer to their house. You just walk out your door and go straight to their house. And so visually, you can see greater time efficiency here, where you just go directly where you want to go. And so if from here you wanted to go to somebody else's house, it's, it's an easy two hops versus going back to that index again, finding where the next person is, and then going to your next destination. And this is generally how native graph databases work. And there's a little catch here. A lot of people claim to have graph database capability. You're looking for the word native. A lot of people will layer graph database capability on top of a relational architecture and give you graph-like access to the data. But underneath, you've still got the same relational database. So. Leaving Neo for j for a second, uh, I found someone who actually did an analysis between MySQL and Neo for j in a side-by-side -side comparison of a simple graph traversal going from node to node to node to node. The test graph has 1 million vertices and 4 million edges. It's not huge, but it's not small either. Basically, they'd pick a root node, and then they would start traversing from that node. Who's one hop away? who's two hops away, 
who's three hops away, etc. And so in other words, what they were really doing is saying, show me all the nodes that are n degrees away from me, or up to n degrees away from me. The results were kind of interesting. So we have our traversal degrees over here, one, two, three, four, five. The uh, millisecond results for MySQL, for Neo4j, uh, a computed advantage of the graph database over the, the relational, and the number of vertices returned. And now you might say, hey, what's going on here? You said there were only one million vertices. These have the duplicates, and it shows you how quickly these can grow when you've got a graph, a network of connected entities. So for the most part, well, it's, it's 2x, maybe 3x. It's, it's an improvement, to be sure, but uh, nothing that's really amazing. Until you get to five degrees, when you've gone five steps out from here to here to here to here to here. After about two hours, they gave up on waiting on the MySQL database. This is about uh, 14, 15 minutes. Still a long time. But we've reached the point where the large graph data set basically crushed the database under its own weight because the MySQL database is trying to do all those successive joins and it's either run out of space uh, or other resources. So the next time you encounter a problem that looks something like this, where you've got lots of entities, lots of connections between your entities, and you're trying to work with this kind of data structure, just keep in mind the phrase index-free adjacency. It may actually be the right solution to the problem. So one more thing. So graph databases may be considered somewhat esoteric. There's no SQL databases that are everywhere. There's still tons of relational databases everywhere. And you might be thinking, well, graph databases, that's, that's, maybe it's an interesting niche technology. I was surprised to find this. So this is from dbengines.com, and they monitor all sorts of aspects of databases, including their popularity. And so if you look at how the popularity of graph databases have grown over the past seven, eight years, it's really remarkable. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different kinds of databases out there, but there's obviously a lot of interest in graph databases and what they can do. And it's part of the whole big data revolution. Now that we can actually store all this data and access it quickly, technologies that can leverage discrete mathematics, which is where those graphs come from, uh, actually can provide a lot of value. So much so, going back to the LinkedIn example, LinkedIn sold themselves to Microsoft for $25 billion. And their core value proposition is they know who your friends are because they have a graph. <laughs> Any questions? Do you know how they measure popularity to get to that graph? Um, you can go to the website. It's, it's, a, it's a wealth of information. It's, it, they have a lot more than just this, too. And, and they have no vested interest in graph databases or anything. They are, they are just collecting data. And they break these out into individual database providers. And so if you're trying to decide what, if you know what type of database you want to use, it will help you decide which provider of that type is, is on the up versus on the down. <coughs> Any others? Yes. So getting rid of the indexes, how does that impact implementation? Does each node just have like a list of references to each adjacent? The, the way they describe it is, is they say it's like a mini index, but it's, it's not, that's not really accurate because they are really direct pointers. And so if you're at that node, you've got the direct pointers, and, and if, depending on the relationships you've got, and this is that concept of adjacency, you can have more than one relationship. Uh, from a given node. So in the Kevin Bacon example, it's acted in would be the relationship. But you could have all kinds of relationships, but yeah, it's that node knows who's on the other end of that relationship by a direct uh, pointer, essentially. And that certainly, there's maintenance with that as well, where if referential integrity, where that guy goes away, then you've got to make sure you've updated all the back pointers. Any others? Yes. Yes. Um, these databases, I can imagine if you have a database that can fit into memory and to, to RAM, you can do these things much faster. If you have to have to put them on the disk and swap them, 
then it becomes really complicated because you have these relationship graphs, but how do you take part of the graph that you have to swap into memory? And do you know if these if these databases are really huge or they make the distinction between uh, these graph databases that are can fit into into memory and those who that cannot fit into memory? Well, I think it's going to be a function of, of how much data you've got. So this test was actually run on a laptop, probably about five years ago, actually. Yeah. And so but whether did it is a swap from disk? Or I, it I, would I would assume in both cases, when you're dealing with a million nodes and four million edges, that you're swapping something to disk. So I, I would assume in both cases that they're hitting the disk. But I, I think in the situation where you think of, of a purely in-memory database, when you see something like this, this tells you it's, it's, you've hit a fundamental problem between your, your chosen solution and the problem you've got. Because this is basically not working anymore. I mean, it's not just taking a long time. It's, it's just not going to work because it's reached the limit of what you can do with the relational technology in, in this particular case. Hence, the Question. relational databases aren't really, they're tabular databases with the concept of relations being forced upon them. Yes. <laughs> DB1 days. <laughs> but we still call them relational. <laughs> What's the performance of, uh, say, sort in a graph database? Like I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Like in a relational, you can do the indexes can already be sorted. But but you act, it's a good question, and you raise another topic, which would make another great lightning talk, and that's that's polyglot persistence, where in the old days you at, at most you had one database that stored them all, that ruled them all, and had all the data and everything. With polyglot persistence, you can pick and choose the appropriate database technologies together, so you could have a relational. You could have a document store, you could have a graph database that are all essentially operating on the same data, but you're leveraging those capabilities in different ways to solve the problems you've got. So, bonus lightning talk, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, John. Thank you.